Welcome to the Functional Medicine Radio Show with your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga, known internationally as the Functional Medicine Doc. Dr. Carrie is committed to helping patients find the root cause of their health problems and fixing the cause with natural treatments so they can feel normal again. Dr. Carey is the founder of Functional Medicine Ontario and is the author of the hit book, Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again. Please welcome your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Functional Medicine Radio Show, the only Internet radio show dedicated to giving you real solutions to improve your health. Not only are they real solutions, but they're natural solutions as well, because as you know, the one and only true wealth you have is your health. I'm your host, Dr. Kerry Drizga, the Functional Medicine Doc, and I'm committed to helping you find the root cause of your health problem, fix the cause with natural treatments, so you can feel normal again and live your life to the fullest. Today's topic is about yoga breathing for health, balance, and longevity. I'm so very excited about today's show because my special guest is Lucas Rockwood. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Lucas Rockwood is a yoga teacher, trainer, nutritional coach, writer, and serial entrepreneur. With a formal yoga training background in hot yoga, ashtanga yoga, gravity yoga, and the yoga trapeze, Lucas has studied with some of the most well-respected teachers on the planet. Lucas founded Absolute Yoga Academy in 2006, which is one of the top 10 yoga teacher training schools in the world, with 2,000 certified teachers. He also founded Yoga Body, an internationally renowned nutrition, education, and publishing organization serving 81 countries. Lucas is a highly acclaimed writer, radio show host, TV personality, business consultant, weight loss expert, and health coach. Lucas, thank you so much for being my special guest today on this episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. You really keep yourself busy with all that that we uh, have in your bio. Definitely. It's been been a busy decade, I would say. That's fantastic. So I'm so excited to talk today about the benefits of the simple thing that we do, breathing. Let's do it. Okay, so... Let's start with just how do, does our breathing affect our pH, our blood pH? So breathing is something that we do all day long and usually just happens all by itself. When we get excited, we start breathing fast. When we're relaxed or calm, we start breathing slow. And one of the interesting things about yoga is that it allows us, in some cases, to take control over our autonomic nervous system. And as the name suggests, autonomic, it's usually automatic, but we can override it. And one of the easiest ways to override it is using our breath. And that's why, for listeners who have been to a yoga class, that's why your teacher is so obsessed with the breath, because it's really what makes yoga unique from other group fitness classes, from a CrossFit workout, from all these other wonderful movement modalities. The magic and the juice of yoga really comes from this mind-body integration, this nervous system training, this autonomic nervous system override that we get by using the breath. And the breath is so effective, so profound in the changes that it can make in your physiology that it can actually change your blood pH. And this is something that comes as a surprise to almost everyone, including most yoga teachers. But when you're, you know, people have probably heard of eating acid or alkaline diet, which there isn't really amazing science in and around. And people have these complicated food charts trying to eat more acid or eat more alkaline. And interestingly, the simplest way to affect your blood pH is through breath. And the amount of CO2 in your lungs and then in your blood affects the amount of carbonic acid, which makes your blood either more acidic or more alkaline. And so if you're looking for a way to change your blood pH, which is not something we're usually trying to do, but just a very interesting side effect of breath, breathing is one of the fastest ways to do it. For people listening, I wouldn't encourage you to do massive blood pH manipulation. That can be dangerous. It's not the greatest idea. But more than anything, this is an indicator of just how powerful breathing is. Within a span of seven or 10 minutes, you can scientifically, physiologically affect your blood pH, and so you can absolutely affect your nervous system state, your brainwave state, your emotional state throughout the day. And Lucas, is there a a good way to breathe and a bad way to breathe? You know, because breathing is so automatic, and it's hard to, for people to like really know, well, I'm doing it automatically, isn't, aren't I just doing it the right way? 
Yeah, the the challenge with breathing is primarily well two two big things. One, we have terrible posture, and so we tend to sit in chairs all day, or we sit behind the wheel of a car all day. And the other thing is we wear restrictive clothing, and more than anything, we have an obsession with our weight. And so you have people walking around literally sucking in their stomach, and then we have people sitting in really inappropriate positions throughout the day. And those two things combined give us restrictive breathing. Now when we stack on top of that, a high stress lifestyle, lots of caffeine, lots of sugar, our breathing rate is usually quite high. So we have poor biomechanics of breathing and then we have an, an elevated breathing rate, all of which amps up our nervous system, specifically the sympathetic branch of our autonomic nervous system. And so in terms of is there a right and a wrong way to breathe, the answer is yes, but it's very dependent on what you're trying to do. So if you're doing a 100-yard you know, dash, you breathe as fast as you need to to keep your body going. If you're a free diver, you breathe as slow as possible and you hold your breath for as long as possible. So it depends on what you're trying to do. For your average listener who's in meetings all day, they're at their desk, they're driving, they're dealing with stressful home life situations, maybe they're chasing a couple of kids around. What we're generally trying to do is affect the rate of our breath more than anything. For people listening right now, most people are breathing about 8 to 12 breaths per minute, which is a slightly elevated breathing pattern. And again, usually elevated by our poor posture, poor movement patterns, and our stimulating diets, caffeine, sugar, starch, that kind of stuff. To create a balanced effect on the body, one of the simplest things we can do is cut our breathing rate by about half. So instead of breathing 8 to 12 breaths per minute, we'll aim to breathe around 4 to 6 breaths per minute. So instead of 8 to 12, we go down to about 4 to 6. Now people are listening are going, I have no idea how many breaths I'm taking per minute. I have no idea how fast my heart is beating. You know, These things are happening. I understand what you're saying, but how do I measure? Here's the simplest way to measure it. You inhale, count to 4. Exhale, count to 4. And just keep doing that, and that'll clock most people in right at about that four to six breaths per minute magic rate. And when we look at the breath, I always encourage my yoga students and, and people listening to think of their breath with three different effects we can have on that autonomic nervous system. We can have water breathing, which is what we just talked about, that balancing effect, that inhale for four, that exhale for four. We can have a whiskey effect, and that's when we basically focus on our parasympathetic nervous system, very down-regulating. It is great for going to sleep. And then we have our coffee effect, which is stimulating to our sympathetic nervous system and this is something we use sparingly but it revs us up most people are walking around using coffee breath on accident all the time they're breathing very quickly uh, very much in relation to the coffee in their hand their breath is mimicking their, their their stimulating coffee and so to create more balance in the body this balanced breath is ideal I often refer to water breathing this four to six breaths per minute as an adaptogenic breath meaning if you're all revved up and wired it'll bring you down if if you're tired and feeling lethargic, it will bring you up. By nature, it's balancing in the same way that you could have a glass of water right when you wake up. You could have a glass of water right before bed. Water is always appropriate, as is balancing breath. If we're talking about a whiskey breath, a breath that puts you to sleep, if we're talking about a coffee breath, a breath that wakes you up, we want to use these much more sparingly. And our main focus, our main driver is this balanced breathing, this four to six breaths per minute. And then I know another thing that I've heard you talk about is something called a nostril check. Yeah, this is a very interesting uh, thing we, we use in yoga, but it didn't actually come from yoga. It's uh, about 100 years old, a little over 100 years ago, uh, a German physician named Richard Kaiser discovered this. And it's not 100% accurate, but probably upwards of 90% accurate. So for your listeners, it'll be interesting. Here's what you do. Take your index finger and put it underneath your nose like it was a mustache. And then I'd like you to exhale about three times. <sighs> what most people will notice is that the breath favors one of your nostrils over the other. What does that mean? It means the, the breath moves more freely, more strongly. It comes out of one side of your nose more than the other. Now, for some people right now listening, it's the left nostril. For other people listening, it's your right nostril. And what this nasal cycle does, it gives us a bird's eye view into our autonomic nervous system. We have two main branches of our autonomic nervous system, our sympathetic nervous system, which is fight or flight, and our parasympathetic rest and digest nervous system. Now, these are oversimplifications, but it's just really helpful for remembering. So we can either be in fight or flight mode or we can be in rest and digest mode. 
And immediately, our listeners and yoga students, we want to assign a value judgment. We want to say, fight or flight's terrible. I just want to rest and digest all day. Well, we don't want to spend too much time in either. We need both periods of busy, active, go, 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 and we need periods of busy relaxation, love, and peace. And more than anything throughout our day, we're looking for balance. These cycles in a healthy individual are changing about every 90 to 120 minutes, so every hour and a half to every two hours. You're making these energetic shifts, which tend to correspond with shifts in brainwave states too. And you're going from a beta to an alpha, from an alpha to a beta. You're going from a sympathetic to a parasympathetic, parasympathetic back to your sympathetic. And this is why it's incredibly hard, if not impossible, to sit down at your desk at work and do three hours of straight work because somewhere in that time you have moved from fight or flight to rest and digest or vice versa and your brainwave states often follow suit. So you've gone from a, a beta brainwave state to an alpha brainwave state and the way in which you process information and feel your, your emotional state, maybe your hunger or your sleeping level, all of those things have really changed. So how do we use this nasal cycle as listeners, as people interested in yoga, as people who want to get more control over our nervous system? The simplest thing that you can do is just check in with your nervous system. That right nostril dominance corresponds with your fight or flight mode, your sympathetic nervous system. This is the nostril you will be in whenever you're hungry. When you feel starved, you'll be in your right nostril because your body is preparing you to go out and hunt or gather for your meal. Your right nostril is, again, with your sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight, which is appropriate for all forms of physical exercise. Also, busy work. So answering lots of emails, cleaning up clutter, all of that kind of mechanical work that you need to do that's part of all of our days. Your right nostril is going to be ideal and it's going to be an indicator that it's a good time to clear out the old email inbox. Your left nostril corresponds with your right brain and corresponds with your parasympathetic nervous system, rest and digest. So in a healthy individual, after eating, within a few minutes, maybe 10, 15 minutes at the most, your body will switch into your left nostril and focus its blood and its energy and its resources on digestion. Now you're in left nostril during digestion, but other times as well, after a deep meditation, after a powerful yoga class, after watching a great movie, after spending time with loved ones. And again, this cycle, ideally, every hour and a half to two hours is changing. So it's not like you're hanging out in fight or flight mode for a full day, although some people do. It's not like you're hanging out in rest and digest mode for a full day, although some people do. We want to be moving back and forth back and forth. That left nostril will always correspond when you're feeling very sleepy. Let's say it's the 10 or 11 a.m. slump or the 3 p.m. hump in the afternoon and you're feeling sleepy, you're nodding off at your desk and you're dreaming of chocolate bars. If you put your finger underneath your nose, I can guarantee you most of the time you'll find yourself in your left nostril. It doesn't mean that when you're in your left nostril, you're always sleepy, but when you're sleepy, you're in your left nostril. When you're rolling around in bed and you can't sleep at night, you're almost always in your right nostril. All of that is just fun party tricks until you realize that, whoa, using yoga breathing, I can have an influence on which nostril is dominant, which means I can have an influence on which branch of my autonomic nervous system is favored, which means I can really set myself up for success or failure when it comes to busy work, creative work, eating, digesting, going to meetings, solving problems, and all of the above. So, Lucas, let's shift gears and talk about um, the best uh, breathing techniques, bef you know, to do before you go to bed. I get, I get asked this question a lot in my private practice at Functional Medicine Ontario about, especially for patients who are having a hard time falling asleep at night and they have some insomnia going on. Do you have any um, techniques to help with uh, pre pre going to bed uh, breathing? Sure. There's two things that we're going to do. We're going to focus on rate and ratio. And so we talked about water, whiskey, and coffee breath. And I'll teach you how to do whiskey breath now. Whiskey breath, as the name implies, will knock you out like a shot of whiskey. So here's, here's what we do. First of all, we talked about how water breath is four to six breaths per minute. A whiskey breath is anything slower than four breaths per minute. For listeners who are new to the practice, you might get down to two to three breaths per minute. As you get more experience, you'll easily get down to one slow breath per minute. So that's the rate. By affecting the rate of our breath, by breathing as if we were cool, calm, collected, asleep, your body responds 
in kind. And it's a similar thing. If you breathe as if you're having a panic attack, no surprise, your body, your your body's chemical system, its endocrine system will respond in kind as well. And suddenly you're, you're literally your body, your heart is pounding and you're all revved up. So we breathe as if we're cool, calm, and collected, which in this case is less than four breaths per minute. For most people listening, you'll start around two to three breaths per minute. You do that just by slowing down the breath. One of the simplest ways to do that is by affecting the ratio of your breath. So rate and ratio are going to have the biggest impact here. And the ratio that we're going to use is a one to two inhale to exhale ratio. In numbers, in specific numbers, I'd encourage you to inhale to the count of four, pause, exhale to the count of eight. Inhale to the count of four, pause, exhale to the count of eight. We've now affected the rate, we've slowed down the breath, and the ratio of our breathing. By focusing more time on the exhale, our exhales are associated with our parasympathetic nervous system, our exhales are associated with downregulation, our exhales are associated with yin energy, with nighttime energy, with sleeping. So simply by affecting the ratio of our breathing and hanging out, spending more time on the exhale, your body responds as if you were already in that state. I usually recommend 10 rounds, and I usually recommend people literally do it on their back, lying in bed on a pillow, because then it allows you to simply fall asleep. Of all the different sleep techniques and sleep hacks and all the things that are out there that are wonderful, this is the most effective thing that I've taught people. And in some cases, it even trumps Ambien and other sleep-inducing drugs. Oh, fantastic. So for all the listeners out there, and you know who you are, when you're having a hard time falling asleep, you should try Lucas's um, Whiskey Breathing. So, Lucas, as I hear you talking about these different ratios, I get the feeling that it's not so much that the breathing techniques, they're, it's not so much about the oxygen, that it's actually more about the carbon dioxide. Because when yeah, we're breathe, breathing out, yeah. we're breathing out carbon dioxide. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's one of the biggest misconceptions, and its uh, I, I always use the analogy of... of Nutrition, because when people look at nutrition and they look at losing weight and they look at dietary fat and they think, if I eat dietary fat, it's going to turn into adipose tissue. It's like, well, it's not really true. It's more complicated than that. You know, dietary fat doesn't just go directly to your hips in the same way that breathing oxygen doesn't suddenly flood your body with oxygen. In fact, in some cases, the opposite. And so we're breathing air and, you know, we let's say there's 21% oxygen or something in the air that we're breathing depending on what altitude you're at. And your blood right now, everybody listening, were you to put a blood oximeter, a pulse oximeter on your finger, which is kind of a fun thing to buy. They cost about 20 bucks. It'll show you your pulse and also your blood oxygen concentration. Most people will be at about a 95 to 99% saturation at any given time. And this goes up and down, and if you have a serious medical condition, you'll be lower, but it's an indication of very poor health if your blood oxygen, for example, is in its 70s or even the 80s when you're just hanging out. So this means most people have pretty sufficient oxygen saturation of their blood at any given time. Yes, when they're stressed out. Yes, when they're relaxed, both. And so if the issue isn't so much oxygen in the blood, what is the issue? Well, the issue that we're manipulating, the the variable that we're manipulating, is carbon dioxide. And just like we talked about people want to assign a value judgment to fight or flight or parasympathetic, meaning they want to fight or flight, arrest or digest, they want to say this one's good and that one's bad. The same thing happens here where people want to say oxygen is good, carbon dioxide is bad, and that's not true. They're both good. It's all about balance. Being awake is good. Going to sleep is good. Exercising is good. Recovery is good. We need this yin-yang balance. The classic yin-yang symbol is something that you should always, always refer back to whenever you're thinking about any mind-body practice because this is really where it's at. It's trying to balance the inhale and the exhale, trying to balance your oxygen, and your CO2. So here's what happens when we're over-caffeinated, over-starched, over-stressed, overworked. As we talked about earlier, we just breathe too much. And breathing too much for a lot of us might be 8 to 15 breaths, maybe even as high as 20 breaths per minute. And what can happen then when you're breathing that fast is you actually off-gas too much CO2, meaning you over-breathe and you release too much carbon dioxide. 
And now people listening go, oh, that's great. We hate carbon dioxide. Well, not really, because here's the thing. Carbon dioxide, by nature, is a vasodilator. It makes your veins, and it's also a bronchial dilator. So your throat, your breathing passageways open up. Your circulation improves. And also, it allows hemoglobin to give off that oxygen that it has stored. So it's really, really helpful to get more oxygen to your cells if we have CO2. So by slowing down our breathing, we actually increase the amount of CO2 in our blood. And we do this because we're not allowing our body to off-gas that CO2 as quickly. So if we breathe really fast, low or no CO2, and we breathe really slowly, more CO2, which has a relaxing effect on the body, it has a vasal dilating effect on our, on our vascular system. It also opens up our air passageways and helps to balance us out during stress. And so when you're thinking about breathing, rather than thinking about the oxygen play, it's important to remember that CO2 is our friend here. And getting a little bit more CO2 in your life is actually moving back towards balance because most of us have been over breathing for a long time. So you gave us some great uh, examples about balanced breathing and then breathing before going to bed, the whiskey breathing. And then um, I wanted to ask you about breathing, uh, a technique for breathing before you actually exercise and how can that impact your exercise? Sure. So we talked about water breath, whiskey breath, and the third one is coffee breath. Now, whenever I say that out loud, people immediately sit up in their chairs and they go, oh, yeah, tell me about coffee breath because we love coffee and we love stimulants and we love sugar and we love starch. And what we need is balance. And so I, I will share with you how to do this, but I will always say proceed with caution because for the most part, we want to focus on that balanced breath. But there is a time and a place for a sympathetic nervous system stimulating breath and that is coffee breath real simple we come back to rate and our rate of breathing to get into a coffee breath status is 20 breaths per minute or faster so if you're making sharp exhalations for example breath of fire which sounds like this that'll clock me in probably around 40 or 50 breaths per minute. So I'm breathing very, very quickly. And what that does is reduces the CO2 in my, in my lungs and hence in my blood. It also, unfortunately, is vasal constricting and bronchial constricting. So if I do that too long, I'll have trouble breathing through my nose. But when I do it short, and by short, I mean three rounds of 20 is what we use before yoga class. It's just a really nice way to shift yourself into a sympathetic mode, specifically if you're going to exercise, if you're going to try to clean up the garage, if you're going to clean up your email inbox, do busy work is a good idea to be in a sympathetic nervous system state. So of the three, water, whiskey, coffee, we use coffee breath the least, and we use it with care. Three rounds of 20 is usually recommended. There are people who do it for 10 minutes or even an hour at a time. Not a great idea can create anxiety, just in the same way that hanging out and drinking endless cups of Starbucks can create a lot of anxiety. So, Lucas, there's so much great information that you shared with us today. Is there anything that we've not spoken about that you think is important for us to know about yoga breathing? The most important thing is to remember that breathing, just like exercise, is a whole category of practices. And just like exercise, a lot of people out there, they, they try to add value by making it very complicated. So you'll go to a personal trainer, and they'll have you standing on some sort of moving surface and wiggling some kind of weird, jiggly weight and all this new technology, when really probably what you need to do is just go run around the building and do a couple of push-ups and call it a day. With breathing, it's very similar, meaning you will find endless complexity in terms of exercises and hand positions, especially in the yoga tradition. And most of that complexity adds very little value. What you want to be is a discerning practitioner and focus on those three. What am I doing with my breath? Water, whiskey, or coffee? It's the only three options. And so once you know that, it doesn't matter whether you're sitting in lotus position, driving a car, or lying on your back. You understand the rate and ratio, and you understand the effect you can have on your autonomic nervous system. And whether you're in a Pilates class or a yoga class or you're just late for a busy meeting, you can use your breath to affect your nervous system in a very profound way. Fantastic. Lucas, how can our listeners find out more information about you? So one of the things that happens when you start learning about this is you get a little bit lost in the right nostril, 
left nostril, water, whiskey, coffee. How fast did he say to breathe? How slow did he say to breathe? So my biggest suggestion would just be I have a one-pager that explains how, to, how this whole thing works, water, whiskey, and coffee breath. If you go to yogabody.com forward slash how to breathe, yogabody.com forward slash how to breathe, you can pick up that PDF, and that's the best place, and that's our website as well. So for the listeners out there, I'll make sure to find that link and have it in our podcast notes so that you can easily access that, uh, that fantastic information from Lucas. Lucas, thank you so much for being my special guest today. This has been an awesome interview. Pleasure to be on the show, and I hope your listeners find value. Oh, I know they will. All right, that wraps up this very special episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show with Lucas Rockwood. And I want to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in today. And I'd like to invite you back next time for another episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show. As always, I'm your host, Dr. Kerry Drizga, the Functional Medicine Doc. Have a great week, everyone. You've been listening to the Functional Medicine Radio Show with your host, Dr. Kerry Drizga, known internationally as the Functional Medicine Doc. Dr. Carey is committed to helping patients find the root cause of their health problems and fixing the cause with natural treatments so they can feel normal again. Dr. Carey is the founder of Functional Medicine Ontario and is the author of the hit book, Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again. Please tell your friends about the Functional Medicine Radio Show, and we'll see you next week with more from Dr. Carey.